Good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us as we come to take another look at the life of David this morning. We briefly looked at him two weeks ago and I want to continue through 1 Samuel and into 2 Samuel, which uh, details for us some of the important highlights of David's life. So we've called it, uh, we're looking at leaders and what makes good leadership. And uh, as we come to look at David, we're looking at the subject of the making of the heart of a leader or what does God actually look for in leaders? Let's just start off with by two verses from the Bible that refer to David. The first is in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, where it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, when the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. He's referring there to one of David's brothers. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So as we focus this morning on the making of the heart of a leader, uh, part of the story of God's plan to save us uh, and part of God's plan of redemption and redemption history is that God raises up natural leaders in all aspects of life, local community level, business, education, church, uh, and of course national leadership as well. We need, uh, we need leaders. And what is it that God looks for? The background to David's emergence as Israel's greatest ever king is that uh, he'd been living under Saul for 40 years. Saul was Israel's first king. And Saul, sadly, as we saw two weeks ago, had shown that he was unfit to rule, even though he had been a king for four, the king for 40 years, but he had no heart for God. That was his fundamental problem, no heart uh, for God. And the people in general seem to be living in fear of Saul. You know, bad leadership always leads to people living in fear. Autocratic leadership, which is bad leadership, always means that people live in fear because they don't govern for the good and the better of the majority of people. They simply look after themselves. And they were fearful because Saul was an unstable king and they weren't sure what he was going to do uh, next. So God then sets about finding a new king, one who will not uh, fail. And he says of David that he is a man after God's own heart. What did God see in the heart of David? God saw something about David, even when he was a young man tending the sheep for his father, Jesse. God saw something about David that would make him a good leader. And with the um, advantage now of hindsight as we look back over his life as recorded for us we can see what some of these things were and that's what I want to share with you this morning the first thing that God saw and as part of David's life is that he regularly exercised his faith in God and that meant that he was able to develop confidence in God's purposes and confidence also in God's power and so what we're going to do is just have a look at a few highlights through the second half of 1 Samuel and a little bit into 2 Samuel here's the first one it's in 1 Samuel 17, when David experiences and faces the Goliath moment, when David, armed with a sling and five stones, is up against the three-meter-tall giant Goliath who has on full military armor. Now, bear in mind, when you watch the rugby, that Victor Matfield and Bucky's Boerter and Eben Epsabeth, they are all about two meters or two meters and a bit tall. This bloke was three meters tall. And so we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45 that David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. In other words, David is saying, The same God that I knew when I was looking after the sheep in the fields and in the hills is the same God that I know now. The same God who helped me kill the lion and the bear who were endangering the sheep when I was the shepherd, is the same God who will help me now. And so David didn't wait for the mighty moment to come. He used all of life, all of the experience of life to prepare him for those real momentous moments when he needed God's help and he needed God's assistance and he needed God's power. And that's what we must do as well. We, 
use all of the moments of life, the routine mundane moments of life. We rely and depend upon God. We exercise our faith in God and we prepare for the moment when we will really need Him. The second instance, we go to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 23, where here we see him building a very strong friendship with Jonathan. So that's what good leaders do. They build strong friendships which are characterized by high levels of accountability and uh, trust. And so we read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23 from verse 14 that David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills in the desert of Zippah. Day after day Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. And then Jonathan says this to me in verse 17, Don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You shall be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And so there's a strong bond of friendship between David and between Jonathan. And David is greatly encouraged by this uh, visit of Jonathan to him. Because weak and trembling faith is always strengthened by being in the presence of strong faith. And the importance of the ministry of encouragement is often neglected amongst us. That we are sometimes so absorbed with ourselves and our own needs and problems that we fail to notice others who also have desperately difficult problems. And they need our encouraging presence and they need our encouraging faith as well. And Jonathan shows us the way to encourage others. He doesn't only tell David to think positively about his situation, but he points him to the Lord God and he urges him to keep trusting in the Lord's promises. And that's what strong friendship can do, that we can be a source of encouragement to others. Now we move on to a third aspect of what made David such a great leader and what God saw in his heart is that uh, we need to continually cultivate a reflective relationship with God. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 30. The background here is that David is running away from Saul, who's trying to kill him. Uh, Saul knows that God's plan is to replace him with David as his king. And David forms his own army. At one point, they actually land up uh, with the Philistines. Now they've been thrown out by the Philistines. They go back to the village at Ziklag, only to find it's been destroyed by the Amalekites. And what's more, his men now blame David for the loss of uh, some of their children. And uh, they even thought about stoning him. And it's at this point that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, But David found strength in the Lord his God. So we see this of David, that on the one hand, he's a very high action person. He's a sort of an A-type personality. Uh, and throughout his life, he's full of plans and projects and purposes. And he's using his gifts and ingenuity in ways um, to run away from Saul. And then after he becomes king, he's building palaces. After occupying Jerusalem, he's organizing his armies to defeat the enemies of Israel. He's planning for the temple that will eventually be built by Solomon. All action. And yet here in verse 6, we read that he is also deeply reflective, that his strength is in the Lord. It's not just on his own gifts and abilities and ingenuity. And so he has this unusual combination of action, ingenuity, projects, and on the other hand, deep reflection and trust in God. Here's a fourth one. That we see about David. Now we're moving into 2 Samuel chapter 6. And uh, it's all about holding on lightly to your own reputation. Again, I need to share with you briefly the background here. Because after a few setbacks, the ark, which represents the presence of God amongst these people in Israel. The ark has finally been brought back to Jerusalem. David is rejoicing before the Lord. In fact, David is dancing naked or semi-naked. And his wife, Michelle, is not impressed. I wouldn't suggest that our musicians do something similar. But when you read this section, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. It's quite intriguing. And you might well ask yourself, what on earth is going on here? The point, I think, is that David is not concerned about his own reputation. His concern is for God's reputation. Now, it's a snare for people in leadership. We constantly, to be 
only concerned about our own reputation. That's the snare. We have to constantly ask ourselves all the time, why am I doing this? Uh, am I overly concerned about my own reputation or am I concerned about God's reputation? Michelle David's wife, in criticizing him for dancing before the Lord as the ark returns to the Jewish people, she resents David's joy in the Lord. David saw through her words to her real problem. She really was her father's child. She was Saul's child. She had the same shortcomings that Saul had when it came to spiritual things. She resented the fact that David and his brand of spirituality of openly worshipping God had been elevated to the throne at the expense of her father. Because whereas Saul, when he was king, led people away from God, David's deep, deep heart concern was to lead people uh, towards God. Don Carson says, Michelle turns out to be her father's daughter. She's more interested in pomp and form and royal robes and personal dignity than exuberant worship. She despises David precisely because he is so God-centered that he cares very little about his own persona. Do you see what David's trying to do here? He's trying to repair Saul's error. He's trying to bring God back into the life of the nation. And so we go on to point five. As we think about the things that God views as being important uh, in the lives of leaders, uh, here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see a very interesting little um, interlude here. And it's all about practicing kindness whenever you can. And this is an example of David doing that, practicing kindness, showing kindness towards a man called Mephibosheth, which means it's a shameful thing. He's a cripple. He's Saul's grandson. Remember that Saul left no stone unturned uh, trying to kill David. And yet far from being out to get revenge, David seeks out this man Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, to show kindness to him because he, this, this man had fallen on hard times. David seeks him out, says this in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 7. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Now, David isn't a perfect man, and we end off with a very sad story, but we need to represent his whole life. But the positive that comes out of the story that we're referring to in 2 Samuel chapter 12 is repent quickly and without reservation. I'm referring to that time uh, when David commits adultery with a woman called Bathsheba. In other words, he sleeps with another man's wife. And in God's sight, it's not okay for leaders, even kings and presidents, to do that. It is always wrong. And then he tries to solve the problem. He compounds his sin and he tries to solve the problem by organizing for her husband to be put into the fiercest fighting on the front line. And so her husband Uriah is killed. And David is thinking to himself, job well done, except that God had seen and God knows. And God then sends the prophet Nathan to speak to David about what he had done. He points the finger at him. You know the famous words in verse 7, you are the man, thou art the man, confronts him with the truth. Very, very uh, courageous prophet Nathan to do that to the king. But here we see the leader's heart in David. Because as soon as he's confronted, there are no attempts at self-justification. No excuses. No Stalingrad strategy kicking the can down the road at the taxpayer's expense. David simply throws himself on the mercy of God. And it's completely different to the rest of the kings. And the way that they reacted when the prophets brought words of judgment against them. And so as we conclude this morning, we need to pray that God will raise up leaders in every generation. That young people will grow, will grow and willingly uh, accept leadership responsibilities in all areas of life. Ultimately, however, we don't trust our human leaders. As human beings, we've been made in such a way that our ultimate leader... And final leader is God. If we are genuinely Christians, we have nothing to fear. Our leader, the one behind all leaders, will not fail us. He will not forget us. He's proved his faithfulness to us again and again. And so we can be confident in God's strength. 
because he has promised that having begun a good work in us, he will carry it on to completion. Thank you for, for joining us today. And let's pray together as we close. Lord, we pray that you will investigate our hearts. We pray that ultimately we will acknowledge and accept you as our king who reigns over us forever. We pray, Lord, that we will always look to Christ, turn away for the things that we put in place as substitutes for you. We pray that our hearts and hopes will always be centered on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.